So hi everybody, I'm Betty Adamu, I'm the CEO and founder of Research Through Gaming and this is one interview in a short series of interviews that I'm doing with fellow authors. Now some of these authors have written about market research, some of these authors have written about something completely different and this is one of those times where one of the authors has written about a completely different subject which is um, very interesting to me because actually it's a subject I know very little about. So here to school me today and talk to me about his writing experience and give some tips and advice is Bob Lederer. Hello Bob. Hi and the reason that I wrote something other than about market research is that that's all I do for a living for the last 24 years. So I think people have read enough about me as far as market research goes. Yes. Well, sometimes it's nice to have a change um, from, from the day job to immerse yourself in a, in a passion project. Um, but Bob, for those who don't know you, because um, I've known you for, for many years now, but for those who don't know you that might be listening to this interview, um, why don't you just um, tell the world a little bit about yourself and, and who you are and what you do? Well, I publish in the United States, but there, it is seen around the world. Um, three different newsletters about the market research industry. We've been doing that since 1995. Yeah. And since 2012, I also do a daily research news video mm -hmm. called Research Business Daily Report, which many more people may be familiar with. We have uh, literally thousands of people that access that video on a daily basis. Yeah, I like to call it Market Research TV. Because whenever I see one of your video, it is, it's like, you know, the headlines of the day, who's buying who, who's doing what. It's, yeah, it's a kind of dedicated market. And people have told me it's a video blog. Yeah. So be it. Yeah. Video blog, vlog, TV, that's all the same thing. Um, so, Bob, you and I um, spoke not that long ago when you very kindly interviewed me about my book, Games of Gamification and Market Research. And in that conversation, I got to learn that you had written a book. And then, as you might remember, Bob, we kind of went off on a tangent. We were, we were just talking for a while. And unfortunately, at the time, we didn't record that interview because that was just great. So this is kind of a reenactment of, of that. So we might be going over some old ground, but this will be great for, for new listeners. And I want you to just tell me a little bit about the book you've written and, and why you wrote it. Okay, well, this is the book. Beyond Broadway Joe, the Super Bowl team that changed football. Wow, um, that's, you read that exactly the way I wrote that. That was good. That was good. Um, it's, um, it, it, it's a book about um, the only uh, time in the history of the New York Jets who play in the National Football League here in the States ever won a Super Bowl. And that was back in 1968-69. The Super Bowl is always played kind of early the next season. Um, and the Jets haven't won one since. They've come close a couple of times, but they've never really gotten back to the essentially what the American World Cup championship, you know, is. Um, I was 16 years old when the Jets won the Super Bowl. Um, had uh, not a care in the world other than trying to get decent grades in school. Yeah. So uh, I had no responsibilities, and I became That's an true. You were really trying to get decent grades in school. You just are you just saying that? No, I, I well, okay, I got pretty good grades. <laughs> okay, uh, but I, uh, I I was really kind of blown away that year. Um, when you're that young, uh, things that happen to you become very impressionable, right. uh, and um, that's what happened. Because not only did my football team win the championship that year, but my baseball team won the won the World Series that year, the New York Mets, and my my favorite basketball team, the New York Knicks, won the won the NBA championship, and that was the first time for all three of these teams. But wow. the football one really excited me more than anything else, um, because because basically for two weeks leading up to the game. We had been told here in the United States from coast to coast that the Jets shouldn't even bother showing up, that they were going to get slaughtered uh, by the other team, which was the Baltimore Colts. And lo and behold, they not only didn't get slaughtered, but they pulled the biggest upset in the history of any Super Bowl game. And this is the 53rd year of the Super Bowl this year. Right. Wow. Okay. So these underdogs came out on top. So what, so what is this book focused on then? Just like the, how, how that team won that game or, uh, 
Essentially, essentially, yes, but that story has been told many times over in the last 50 years. The Jets had a particular player named Joe Namath. They called him Joe Willie Namath. Okay. Um, and he was a, a great football talent. He was also basically converted into a celebrity by the owner of the Jets. He right. became a sex symbol. He right. actually became the first American football player to attract women to come and watch American professional football games because he was just such a, a sexy swinging bachelor. And so um, he's always been the face of the Jets winning that game. Yeah. And he's written a couple of... Sorry, but so, so this Joe guy, he's, he's Broadway Joe. That's Broadway Joe. That's right. Broadway but, but Joe. Why Broadway fact, Joe? Well, his, his rookie year uh, with the Jets, which is 1965... Uh, one of his teammates in uh, training camp um, because he knew that the Jets were making a conscious effort to really turn this guy into a celebrity. Mm -hmm. um, saw him walking around. I heard he'd been walking around in Midtown Manhattan and he just dubbed him Broadway Joe. And in a couple of weeks time, um, the, the best selling and biggest sports magazine here in the States called Sports Illustrated put Joe Namath on the cover on Broadway. And and called him, you know, Broadway Joe right there on the cover of the magazine. So that's how he got his name. So right. he's told his story many times over. But I was always fascinated by the other guys on the team, as I call them now, the special 44 Jets who helped Joe win the Super Bowl. There's another little story that goes behind this that's very important. Okay. Uh, the, the Super Bowl game was played on Sunday, January 12th, 1969. Okay. Um, Three nights before, on Thursday night, and that would have been the 9th, I guess, uh, of January, uh, Joe Namath was honored at a dinner as the football player of the year in the United States. Wow. And at the dinner, someone supposedly heckled him from the back of the room and said, you're going to get killed on Sunday. And Namath said, not only you know, are we not going to get killed, but we're going to win the game, I guarantee it. Okay. Now, to guarantee that you're going to win a game in any professional sport, is really generally considered a roll of the dice because any even a bad team can beat a good team, yeah. you know, under the right conditions. It's bravado, isn't it? You know. Yeah, well, exactly. So I was always curious, what did the forty-four other players think when their leader went before the media and before a dinner and guaranteed that they were going to win the game, and especially because the other team usually doesn't take that kind of bravado very well. Right. And the Baltimore okay. Colts did not. Um, it actually, though, threw them off their game because they got so intent to basically ram you-know-what down Joe Namath's throat um, that uh, they kind of got out of their game and they didn't play you know, the normal uh, uh, way that they would play. They played with too much emotion. They were too angry and such. Okay. So, so Broadway Joe, so, so the context is Broadway Joe, before this big, important game, has psyched out the other team, but almost in a weird placebo effect said, we're going to win, and actually they did, and, and the whole team was behind Joe to, to win. And what I discovered in my book is that he also psyched up his teammates. Yeah, yeah. Because there were teammates who weren't sure they were going to win the game. Right. And several of them said, hey, our, our star quarterback just said, we're going to win. I, you know, I think we got a good chance to win. Yeah, yeah. Professional players uh, generally have a great deal of self-confidence going into any game. You have to. You're a professional. You're getting paid, you know, yeah. to play to the best of your ability. So you hear about the um, trash talking before boxing fights and things like that. Now, now, did you say this game happened in 1967? No, 68. And this game actually happened in early 69. Okay. So this is obviously before my time. And I'm just wondering, do you think that this was maybe the original foundations for that kind of pre-game, like trash talking, right? Like, no, where, actually, actually, Nate, actually um, at the time, First of all, it wasn't played up that much in the media that, that Namath had made the guarantee. I first really heard about it on TV on Sunday as they were starting, you know, in the introduction to the game. What had really happened here in the States, and this you may recall, even though you weren't alive at the time, is that Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, 
used to not only guarantee he was going to win, but he used to predict the round he was going to win in. So yes, Namath, so Na- Joe, Joe Namath was seen as kind of, you know, adopting what, what Cassius Clay and Muhammad Ali was generally doing twice a year. Right. You know, he'd say, I'll, I'll knock the dope out in eight rounds or something like that. So right. Namath was kind of picking up the mantle and doing what, what Muhammad Ali was doing all the time. Okay. So about, about your intentions, Bob, because, because, you know, you've obviously taken, taken your love of football a step further than most people, right? You, you remember this game. It was a great year. Three, three of your uh, sporting teams had had a great year when you were 16. But what made you say, actually, I want to look beyond this star player Broadway Joe. And actually I want to know, I want to know about the other players. And, and then how, how did you do that? I mean, did, did you go out and interview these these uh, guys on the team? How, how well, you- let's 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 start. Let's start with your first question. Um, I've all, I'm a writer by profession, although I'm not a sports writer. I'm a I'm a business writer, and uh, I've always had this inkling that I wanted to write a book about that team right. because it meant so much to me. The euphoria of the Jets winning that game when it was finally over stayed with me for a week. Um, it was that profound. I guess today you could compare it to, you know, a country winning the World Cup. Yeah. I know there are celebrations that go on and such. Yeah. Um, and, but what really came to me was watching the game about three years ago with my sons. And I'd never really had an angle on how I could write a book because I wasn't going to write another book about Joe Namath winning the Super Bowl for the Jets. Wow. Uh, and so I watched the game and one of my sons asked me, who is this guy? And then my other son said, who is that guy? And after I explained who they were, I turned to my wife, who had been egging me on to write the book, and I said, I just figured out the angle. I'm going to write about everybody else on that team because nobody has ever explored that. Really? No one? Like, the focus has always been on this, this Joe guy? Yeah, the they, they Jets had some other big stars. Uh, one of them wrote a book, but the others generally have been, you know, um, accessories to the crime you know in other books they've been talked about here or there but they've never really been the focus and as i mentioned early on there were 44 other players who put on a uniform for the new york jets that year and uh, so i decided i'm going to go out and find them and talk to them which naively i had you know never given a thought as to how i was going to do that Yeah, yeah um and luckily i have an associate who is very good on the computer and on the internet and helped me locate these people. But then it became my responsibility to convince them to talk to me. Okay. So, right. So rewinding slightly. So your associate is Chris that I said hi to before we press record. So, so hi, Chris. And Mm -hmm. so what Chris, Chris, uh, I guess he, he went online to see if they were, these guys were on Facebook or Twitter. He reached out and then you kind of took over the conversation. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into the detail, but he had a much more specific way to do it than that. Right. Okay. Um, and, and so he methodically helped me find, um, I guess there were probably 38 or 40 that we actually tried to find. Um, we knew that a half dozen of them had already died. Um, and so we tried to find the, re- the remainder um, and even those that had passed away, we tried to find their wives, their children, um, so that we could find out from them about their, their dad. Yeah. And then we, I decided to do one more thing, and that is to find some of the best players that played against these guys and right. try to get their first-person testimony about what was it like to play against Joe Namath right. um, and, and these other guys on the team. Yeah. So potentially this is quite um, an emotive series of, if you like, depth interviews that you're about to embark on. Because I I imagine that these guys are uh, a little bit older. You know, they're recalling things that had happened a very long time ago. They've potentially felt a little bit maybe sidelined over the years with the focus being so much on Joe. And then, of course, if you're speaking to partners and children and they've, they've lost their 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 husband or, or or dad that's that's quite um maybe quite di- did you find that quite difficult or was it quite difficult? no it, it was uh, i mean the real task as i mentioned before was to get them to talk to me yeah and i had to figure out a hook and my hook became telling the truth 
I had been a fan of the, of the team since 1963, which was five or six years before they got to the Super Bowl. Right. Um, and so I watched as every one of these guys was brought onto the team. And I read everything I could. In those days, there were nine or 10 New York newspapers. And I read everything I could read every day um, and just retained, you know, uh, in my head, a lot of what these people were all about. Yeah. So as an example, there was one guy, his name is Bill Baird. And he was a little bit small for his position and light for his position. Um, and every year when you would pick up the newspaper or pick up a football magazine that would tell you what's going to happen this year, it would say, this is the year Bill Baird is finally going to be replaced. Right. Bill Baird never got replaced. And I often wondered, wow, everybody keeps saying that he's going to be gone this year, that they're going to find someone better. They never found anybody better. So talking to Bill Baird, uh, my hook with him was, um, you know, I'm one of those guys who read every year that you're going to be replaced and yeah. you never got replaced. How is that? Yeah. And so I learned a lot about, about him and his particular skills and his particular skills more than anything were this. Right. He could outthink um, the opposition as, as to what had to be done. And he could prepare ahead of time and, and know instinctively what he had to do on every play. Uh, and so he made up for his lack of height, his lack of weight, uh, and he was speedy. Um, so he, he found ways to get around um, and still do a good job at his position. So how did you interview these guys? Did you get a chance to meet with any of them over a coffee and talk, or, or was it more for, over the phone? No, I, I, I had hoped actually to do it over Skype. They're all over the United States. Right. A uh, handful of them are in New York. There's a couple of them down on the southeast in Tennessee and Virginia and whatever. There's a couple in Florida, a couple right. of other guys in, in Denver, uh, a few on the West Coast. Nobody right. was at all close to me. I live in, in and around Chicago, and none of them lived here in the Midwest. Okay. So it was mostly done on phone. I did, get, I did get invited to like a mini reunion that the team had uh, in January of 2016, um, and I met about a dozen of them there at, at that meeting. But the others I know only over the phone. Yeah. And in fact, there's going to be a 50th anniversary reunion that the Jets are having next month. And I am making it a point to be there and to meet every one of these guys and wow. to get them to sign my book. Yeah, that's fantastic. So when you were interviewing these guys, was that 16-year-old wanting to come out and just be like a fan? I mean, did you find it hard to kind of contain the sheer excitement that you're speaking to these guys that you, you know, you've seen on the TV? And Well, my, my voice did not go up a couple of octaves, but my wife told me I was having, <laughs> my wife told me I was having way too much fun. Right. <laughs> and I think that answers, I think that answers your question. I, um, you know, asking them about things that I remembered and then as I obviously went along, picking up things that other players had told me that I could then throw at them to see what their reaction was, uh, was, was a good part of it. Um, I mostly did the interviews just off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, that's the way I kind of do things anyway, even in my in professional you know, work for research, um, because I like to see what the other person is going to say and bounce off that yeah. and, and go with it. Just have a, a rolling conversation. So there's a few there's a few tips that you could give today, Bob, for other authors, I think, but also other market researchers, because although, you know, on the surface, this is this is definitely not a market research book, but you actually, actually, it is in a sense. In fact, I'm making two presentations about the connection between this book and market research um, at well, conferences. And, I, and, I'll, and I'll give you I'll give you one of the examples I'm going to use. Yeah, sure. Oh. At, at noon on January 12th, which is three hours before the Super Bowl game, the Jets were worth, as a team, $6 million. Right. At 7 o'clock that night when the game was over, the Jets were now valued at $16 million. Wow. Today, um, the team is worth $2.75 billion. Wow. Um, they basically took um, a, a tattered... A uh, terrible football team. I'm talking about the new owners that bought the team in 1963 from the old owners um, who had run it under a separate name. Um, and, and they created a new product or a product spinoff 
And right. that's the way I look at what they've done here because they now have, for 50 years, they've been building and building and building the brand equity behind yeah. this team. And it's true in, in most professional sports things, the franchise, whether the team wins or loses, is worth a tremendous amount of money. Yeah. If you win, you're worth more. But even if you don't, the franchise is worth a lot, especially in the New York metropolitan area because of the sheer size of, of, uh, um, of the area. Sure. So, so there's definitely learnings there for a market researcher right, in terms of building a brand, building brand equity. And how, and how, you, do, and how you do the research for it. Well, yeah, uh, that, that's the point I was going to make earlier because although on the surface it's not a market research book, you have used research skills to conduct what you said around like 40, you know, qualitative depth interviews. So yeah. um, if there is a student listening to this, that's thinking, do you know what? I, I want to speak to participants who are going to open up to me and feel more comfortable. What would your advice be to that person to say, well, you know, these are the two or three things that you can do to make a participant feel comfortable to, to open up and, and to just kind of really speak to you less as a market researcher, but maybe more as a, a colleague or a friend. Yeah, I think, you just, I think you just nailed it. I think you have to relate to them at their level. Right. Now, m- most of the, now, most, you know, and, and that became a little bit easier for me here, strangely enough. The average age of these players is 75 years old. Okay. I just had my 66th birthday this year. So I'm removed from them by maybe 10 years. But one player made a great thought to me as I was talking with him. He said, I said, you know, I'm really excited about the ability to talk to you and all your player, all your teammates. I never would have thought this was possible when I was 16 years old. And he said, Bob, when you were 16, it wouldn't have been possible. But now you're 66 and I'm 74. And we are both senior citizens. And so we are very much in the same, you know, age group. Um, And so it's very easy for us to relate to each other. And so that's the first thing you have to try to relate to them on that level. You have to, you know, you have to talk with them about their, their lives, you know, their families to show that you care about that. Um, And you have to, as I was able to relate to their careers and say, I remember when you did this or when this happened to you. Um, In fact, Two of my favorite players um, at first were very reluctant to talk to me because they said that they had told their story hundreds, if not thousands of times over the last 50 years. And I said, I'm going to ask you about stuff that you have not been asked about for a very long time and maybe ever. And each of them said, like what? And I told them and they said, okay, let's do the interview. Ah, oh, interesting. So, so that, so it's all about showing empathy, but also doing some research beforehand to show that you are very passionate about the subject, you're knowledgeable, so that if somebody's going to open up to you, they know that they're speaking to somebody who knows what they're talking about. You yeah, know? you just used a word that I think is very key, which is passion. Yeah. You have to be passionate about the subject. My family has been asking me, what are you going to write about next? And I'm really at a loss right now because I don't have something that I'm quite as passionate about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I am about this subject. So, yeah. you know, I'm still kind of f- trying to figure that out. So where can, if I wanted to go out and buy the book, where could I find it? Well, it's published by HarperCollins. So you can find it on the HarperCollins website. Okay. Um, th- the best price you can get on it right now is at Amazon. Um, okay. If you want to buy a hardcover copy, it's like 18 bucks. Uh, it's available, obviously, there, you know, for Kindle. It's available in an audio book which I also recommend. I, I heard the gentleman who, who read the book and I, I enjoy listening to him reading my book. Oh, wow. um, but it's, uh, it, it's an interesting thing. And it's, um, I, I think if you, if you try to relate to it, not even beyond sports, but at um, a story of these 40 other guys um, who have great individual stories to tell. Yeah. Um, who, who, who talk about each other in the most loving of terms. I mean, as much as Joe Namath is seen, in fact, even by me, as something of a hog as far as publicity goes, um, his teammates love him to death. Right. And they recognize, as I do, that they would not have won the Super Bowl without Joe Namath. He was a superlative talent. He was a difference maker. 
uh, yeah. in that game. He was he was what what lifted the Jets above the Baltimore Colts. Um, but even Joe, after the game, was famously asked, um, "Congratulations, you're the king of the hill." And Namath didn't waste a second and said, "No, I'm not the king of the hill." We're the kings of the hill. We've got the team. Right, and right. so the book really the book really explains first about Joe Namath and what a what a great talent and, and outstanding celebrity and unusual f- figure he was. But then it, at the very end of Namath's chapter, it explains, but he couldn't have done it without a great offensive line, without great wide receivers, without a great full, excuse me, running backs. And defensively, without a great defensive line and great linebackers and, and great defensive backs and a superlative kicking game that the Jets had that year. And Namath has been always willing to concede that. One of the problems is that we live in a, in a time of what we call the 15-second soundbite, which is what the media will give you to make your point about something. And so Namath generally will get asked, tell us about the Super Bowl or why you guaranteed the Super Bowl. And he'll answer that question, and he never gets to make the point about, hey, these guys, you know, I I couldn't have won without them. And in fact, the crowning point of that point is that um, there are all-star games at the end of every professional football season, and the the best players at each position uh, in one league play the best players in the the other league. And the Jets that year had 11 players who went to the all-star game. Very, very, you know, huge number uh, right. because there's only, there's only 22 guys on the field at a time. So literally half the guys that were at the game were Jets. Um, and, uh, and Namath was only one of them. There were 10 other guys who were considered, you know, the creme de la creme at their position that year. Right. So, I mean, okay, we, we spoke about this before, Bob, that I am not into sport at all. And um, uh, despite having a husband who's a massive Tottenham Hotspurs fan, um, I didn't really grow up in a sporty household or anything. He like should that. have interviewed me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, 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 you know, what's, what's quite interesting is that even though I have zero interest in sport, what I love about what I've heard about your book, not just today, obviously, in our conversation before, is just that this is storytelling. This is, and, you know, the, that's the big buzzword in market research. But you're, I love the idea that these are little snippets of stories about these guys who were just you know absolutely in the limelight you know all right okay joe was in the limelight more but these guys inevitably were were famous and on tv and inspiring young men and women you know like like yourself and i'm sure lots of other and and you know a number of them have said to me how much they they really like the book because it is for them a record that they can pass on to their generations beyond the present one so that their, their grandkids, their great grandkids, their great, great grandkids long after they're gone, will be able to pick up and read, you know, what great, great granddad did back in the 1960s and how he was part of a team that won a Super Bowl. So it's not just beyond Broadway Joe, but beyond life right it's beyond well yeah i mean you can look at it that way as well yeah i, I hadn't thought of it that way but but it's it's a, it's a it's a re- as i said it's a record yeah. um that that can be passed on that that's otherwise difficult i mean everybody that's gotten the book now it's been distributed a couple of weeks to the players themselves they've all you know gotten back to me so of course i read my chapter first i wanted to see what yeah. you wrote <laughs> yeah. um but uh, a number of them come back to me and said, you know, you told me something about my teammates I had no idea about. In fact, one guy wrote to me the other day uh, and said, I give the book an 11 out of 10, but you told me stuff in my chapter that I didn't know about myself, <laughs> which, which now that, that's a nice research compliment. Yeah, yeah. Okay, like what? Give, give me an example. What was one of the things? Well, in, in his about? case, um, he got traded um, from one team to another team uh, before he came to the Jets. And I had discovered that in the trade, there had been a substantial amount of money that had changed hands. And he always thought he'd been traded even up him for this other guy. And then he found out from reading his chapter that there were several hundred thousand dollars that were also involved in the deal. So wow, nothing, nothing earth shaking, but he had no idea about that. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, he also didn't know how or why he had 
why he had been recruited to come to the Jets. Uh, he had been re recruited basically as a leverage against a player that was starting ahead of him, but whose contract had expired. And the Jets wanted to put pressure on him and say, you know, we can replace you with this guy. And in fact, it was a second guy that they brought in that could also, where it was also, you know, raised as, as somebody that could replace him. Right. Um, so, right. so th this, this, pl this player said he, he never knew that. He thought he'd just been recruited because he was a good player. Yeah, how interesting. I, was he upset? <laughs> just like No, no. He, I mean, he doesn't care. It's 50 years later. He just, yeah. it, it's just these little, you know, odds and ends yeah, uh, yeah. that, uh, you know, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you know, I, if you're introspective about those things, uh, you know, it, it can make a difference. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, we had some, a couple of tips from you about giving um, a good interview, getting people to open up. But I want to hear about your writing process. So first of all, how long did it take you to write this book? From start uh, co combined, combined the research and the writing took me three years. Three years. Uh, okay. And I, what I tried to do was do an interview, uh, collect, well, do an interview. And after I'd done about a dozen interviews, then I had enough information about any particular one of those 12 guys, more or less, that I could write a chapter. Right. Uh, because again, I not only was taking their, um, each of the players' memories, but I was using my own and I was uh, taking notes of what their teammates had told me about them. Sure, sure. So, so I'd write a chapter. You. And then I would write, you know, we, we would transcribe the interview. Every interview, I'm like Bob Woodward, I taped every interview that I did. Yeah, sure. Um, because I wanted to be sure that I was accurate um, and I would have a record to fall back on if anybody ever said to me, I, I, I never told you that. Well, so I have it on record. Um, and then basically, so I would write it, write a chapter, each chapter, each player on the team got his own chapter. Right. And probably on average, each chapter got rewritten two more times as I would find more information. Yeah. Uh, and then I had to kind of coalesce it and bring it all, pull it all together. Um, so yeah, it took, uh, it took about three years. So is that three years, I'm, I'm assuming, obviously, three years doing that while you are still running? Well, I was doing, well, I was doing my regular day job, yeah. Okay. And that's where Chris, that's where Chris came in. He, he okay. really helped me as far as keeping the business rolling as well. Okay. So, so we say thanks to, to Chris as well. And in that time of you writing, well, I mean, overall, did you enjoy, did you enjoy the process of, of writing? I'm sure you enjoyed the interviews, but did you enjoy the process of writing? Well, I enjoy writing overall, and I enjoyed writing this because it was a different kind of subject matter. Right. When you write about market research for 20-something years, uh, there can be a sameness to it uh, because things do change quite a bit, but at the same time, the base level you know, doesn't change a lot. And there's, there's more of a muss and a fuss than there is a lot of concrete as far as the change that goes on in the industry. And while, and while you were writing... Did you feel like you needed to have a certain ritual to get yourself into the, the mode of wanting to write? Do, do you have any tips or, or tricks for aspiring authors who might say, well, I'd, I'd also like to write a book while I'm running a business. And maybe, Bob, you've got some advice. Just write. Uh, you know, when I was in college, when I was in college and I knew I wanted to write for a living, I, I had two um, associate editors of, of the local newspaper. Uh, and I said to him, well, how do I get a writing job? And they said to me, you just write. Yeah. You hone your skills. Every, every time you write something, you get a little bit better, you know, at your writing skill. Um, yeah. I, I enjoyed, I looked forward to getting on my computer and working on, you know, either writing the next chapter or editing what I had or transcribing, you know, an interview that I just did because it was, yeah. It was a labor of love, you know, I, and, I, and I had scheduled that this book would come out the year of the 50th anniversary of the Super Bowl Jets victory. So I had two and a half, three years to get it done, which was also, I, I guess, it, 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 try to set yourself a goal. And my goal was to get it done yeah. uh, by, by before, nine, before 2018 yeah. so that it could be properly assessed, you know, for its value to a publisher. Sure. 
what great timing. I mean, talk about like the best marketing and PR opportunity, right? The book's going to come out just when this big 50th anniversary is going on. Well, the, the reason I ask you these questions, Bob, is because I think I had a very different experience writing my book, because although mine was also a labor of love, I discovered a few things about myself that I didn't like. Uh, one is that I've got a really a, a sh much shorter attention span than what I thought I'd had. And I also realized that uh, although my husband has told me for a while, because we were we've been friends um, for uh, 10 years before we, we even started dating, he's always known that I don't have a lot of patience. And I would say, Psh, you know, I'm the most I'm really patient. I, I have so much patience. And then I would sit and write this book and do research. And, and I had this thing that I wanted everything done now, now, now. And I realized that I don't have any patience at all, coupled with a low attention span um, was not the, the greatest thing. So did you learn anything about yourself that you either didn't like or that you thought, actually, this is a good thing about myself that I'm learning through this process? Um, hmm. What did I learn about myself? Chris, what did I learn about myself in, <laughs> you in writing this book? <laughs> While I'm thinking and he's thinking. Yeah. Um, you, you were able to hone more of the journalistic side of things in a human interest direction than you. Yeah, it, yeah, you know, he makes a good point. Um, I had Chris, who doesn't know anything about sports and doesn't care. And I had um, my sister-in-law, who was working here at the time. And as I finished each chapter, I would give it to them and say, read it and is it interesting because right. they couldn't have cared less about the players yeah but they could tell me is this interesting does it hold your interest is it compelling yeah. is it funny that sort of thing because all of those things are necessary i had to uh, i had to appeal i knew to various audiences one who was a hardcore fan yeah. uh, somebody who was about as old as me and remembered the team but wow. then i had to also try to appeal to younger fans and what I've really discovered is that that's really hard to do because people who are in their 20s and 30s now who are as big a fan of the Jets as I am seem not to care what happened 50 years ago, even though it's the only time the team ever won. And I, I, I find that rather peculiar, and I'm, I'm actually shocked by it. A lot of people have tried to explain it to me, but you know, I, I just don't understand it because this is, your, this is the legacy yeah. of the team that you, you know, that you're devoted to. I'm sure your husband, you know, with, with, with Tottenham, you know, is like that. Um, I, in yeah. fact, I'd, I'd be, I'd be curious if, if he cares about the history of, of, you know, of that team going back before he was even born. Yeah. He knows the history and anytime there's a game on, he'll always say, Oh, you know, um, the, the last time they played against this team, this happened. So it's not just about when they won or when they lost, but actually how they, performed against certain teams throughout history he's got yeah but, but i'm but i'm talking about how how the jets performed against teams 55 years ago yeah. or 50 years ago well, so it, it, it's ball. taking it you know and and the other thing is it, it was a different the other thing that's interesting about the book and why i actually recommend it if you're a sports fan a lot of it is really uh very telling about what it was like to be in sports uh, in those days. Mm -hmm. um, as an example, and I'll just give this one thing. Uh, fans back there didn't care what the players made as far as money goes. Right. Today, that's all we hear about. What's the transfer fee for this guy to be you yeah. know, moved from this soccer team to this soccer team? How much money did, did, the, did one professional team pay another professional football team in order to steal their top player away? Mm -hmm. That right. sort of thing. How much money? And, and, and I'll give one great example. Joe Namath was signed by the Jets to an unheard of three-year contract for $427,000 in 1965. Right. And it was the talk of all sports for a year. Right. Last year, um, a quarterback on the Detroit Lions got a five-year, $158 million contract. <laughs> so roughly $30 million a year. And you know what? It was hardly news because by the next week or two, somebody got even more than that. Yeah, Namath, Namath set a standard by what he was getting paid that obliterated um, the pay scale that existed in professional football in those years. Even, even the best players were making twenty or $25,000 a year. And yeah, suddenly yeah. this rookie coming out of nowhere was getting $100,000. 
yeah. you know, in annual, um, you know, uh, pay. So um, it was a di- it was a different time. So you you when you were talking a moment ago about how um, again this is a sweeping generalization, but that the majority of young people don't know that much about the history of the Jets or about this game of the place. And I wonder, Bob, do you think that's because all they've heard about is this Broadway Joe, right? So maybe maybe all these years they've grown up just hearing about, oh, this Broadway Joe guy who won that game. And maybe they were never really interested beyond that because they, you know, they that's all they heard. Yeah, they, they don't they don't know they don't know who a lot of the I mean, I was talking with somebody at a radio station the other day that wanted to not interview me, but wanted to interview some of the players. Right. Fine. Um and they had three recommendations of guys they wanted to have. Well, um, for various reasons, none of the three was a very good selection for me to suggest to them to put on the air. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I recommended somebody else who wasn't quite as big a name. Mm. Every bit as good a player, every bit as important to the team, but not as big a name. Mm. And they were not interested because wow. they're looking for, you know, the big name player, the guy that everybody recognizes and not somebody who was a great player in his own right, but never got the publicity um, yeah. that, that some of these other guys got. And, wow. um, and, and I think with, with young people today, uh, I guess in, in a sense, if you were to sit down with your family and look at a family tree, there would be some people who would be really interested in great, great grandpa who they never heard of before or some great uncle or cousin, yeah. you know, who happens to be related to somebody in history who is really important. Um, but I'm not sure that everybody in the family would be all that interested. And that's what I'm really running into, that uh, there is a, you know, it's like, mm, okay, uh, the guy was on the team and, and that's nice, but I've never heard of him, so, so what? And my attitude in going into this was every one of these guys was integral. Yeah. In in winning it that year. In fact, even even the guys who played the smallest roles, my attitude is they still contributed in a very significant way because who's to say that a replacement to them would have would have performed as well as they did or made a particular play that they did in an important moment. Sure. You can you can never know that. So I even some of the guys I've talked to, some of these lesser known people the 44th best player on the team have said to me, wow, thank you for including me in this book. And I said, you were one of the players on the team. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how could I not? How could I? Well, maybe right? they, they were so, they were so sidelined that you're like potentially one of the only people that has. Wanted to- it, it, most of them, most of them said to me, wow, you know, somebody really wants to talk to me. In fact, that was the first person I called. Um, was um you know one of the important players but not you know but not a star by any means okay and and he actually was uh was very very severely brain damaged at this point from playing football and uh, his wife answered the phone and we talked and i told her who i was and she said give me a second and she put her hand over the telephone so i wouldn't hear it and she said to her husband thank you holly Curly, you won't believe this, but there's a guy on the phone that wants to talk to you about the Super Bowl. Oh. And she and she came on and said, he's been waiting for 48 years to tell anybody, to be asked by anybody about what happened that year. Uh, and I didn't hear exactly to that, you know, to that way from everybody, but the inference was there that, hey, you're really interested in what I thought was going on that year? Uh, or what I saw happen that year. Um, so it, it's, it, it, was, it was a very interesting exercise as far as that goes too. Yeah, this is very cool. So it's, it's not just about celebrating the underdogs. I mean, these guys that gave their time to you, it's made a difference to them as well. It, it has, and in fact, my, my wife said to me, you know, I know you went into this and you had various reasons for wanting to do this, but she said, I know you and you really wanted to do this for those guys. Right. Yeah. And I, and you know what? She's right. I, um, I, I want these guys to have their day in the sun. Yeah. Uh, as I said, they the average one is 75 years old. The youngest is 71 wow. and the oldest is 86 or 87. 
And I want these guys to have one last hurrah uh, because on the 50th anniversary, that's going to be the last hurrah. There isn't going to be a 55th anniversary celebration or a 60th. Oh, yeah. By the time the 60th comes around, most of these guys will be gone and the ones that are still here will all be in wheelchairs. Yeah, yeah. So th this is it. This is their, the, the last big chance for them to get the credit and the salute yeah. that I know they deserve. So in terms of not just American football history, but certainly in terms of the Jets and their history, Actually, this is quite an important book. This isn't just like a, a random side thing that you could... This is actually an important book. You've, you've got a record from these guys who are, are quite elderly now. Like you said, there's not going to be another opportunity like this again. So, so actually, in terms of that team's history, this is, this is an important story. It, 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 it's also a vital book in the history of American professional football because after the Jets won... Uh, a number of things took place, and I'm not going to go into all the detail here. Somebody who reads the book can, can, can read it, but it, it changed the way football was in a number of different dimensions. Um, there were plans that the league had before the Jets won that would have radically changed the way we have football today. And wow. things were put in place back in 1969 after the Jets won that game that remain in effect today. Uh, simply because the Jets won that game. And again, wow. I don't want to go into all the details because it just gets too complicated, but, but it's the last chapter in my book. It really is the, the chapter that explains how, how the Jets winning that game changed football. Wow. Okay, so we're, we're going to wrap up now, Bob, but before we go, let's see that book again, if you've got it. I thought you'd never ask. Yeah. Okay, so Beyond Broadway, Joe, great photograph. Can I see the back as well? Oh, yeah, the back has some interesting quotes from some of the players. I'll, I'll read one that I particularly yeah, yeah, like. Um, one of the players who played, uh, he's a big physical lineman, um, said to me, um, I, have a I have a dented football helmet in my, in my uh, den, and it's where I place all the obituaries of the guys who hurt me while I was playing football, <laughs> and I can't wait to, for more of those guys to go into the helmet. <laughs> and remember I told you about Billy Baird and he was small and he wasn't, you know, he wasn't strong. Okay. He, he said to me, when a younger, faster player came to camp to replace me, I point out to the coach, he's going the wrong way that much faster. <laughs> it's a series of, of great quotes that these guys, you know, gave yeah. me for the book. So how, how many copies, uh, what, is it out? Can I, I can buy it now? Oh, yeah, you can buy Amazon. Go to Amazon. Beyond Broadway, Joe, it will not be hard to find. Okay. Uh, and it's, as I said, it's, it's uh, very uh, inexpensive. You know, I think, like I said, $18 on Amazon. You can have it in a couple of days. Or if you want to get it in the Kindle version, oh. you can get I'm it. I'm going to be really nosy now. I'm going to be really nosy. So how long has it been out and how many copies? You know, it, it, came, it came out September 11th. Okay. Um, to, so last Tuesday. Okay. Um, I don't know how many copies they printed. I, I've asked them that. They haven't told me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, I, but I'm very curious about that myself. Um, you know, we're, we're hoping it's, it's, you know, good. I know it's going to do very well in New York because that's a, that's a given. Yeah, there's, so yeah. many, there's so many people who live in New York and there's so many people who are Jet fans that I'm sure it's going to do very well with them. But um, the other thing is there are a lot of transplanted New Yorkers literally all over the world. And I'm sure there are a good number of, of Jet fans in London. In fact, I would bet, and I don't know this, but I would bet there's probably a, a tavern or a bar in London that all Jet fans go to every Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening, it would be in London, yeah. and watch the Jets on, on, you know, on, on closed circuit television. Because that's what happens. I, I, probably, I, I have to say, I haven't, I haven't walked past, but maybe because it's not on my mind, right? I'm not looking out for that. It's, it's, it's not on mind either, but I, I came across a couple of websites the other day. One is in Dallas, Texas. And Dallas, Texas is 1,800, 2,000 miles from New York. Um, but there is a bar in Dallas, Texas, where 500 Jet fans come together every Sunday and watch, watch the Jets wow. play. And there's another one in, uh, uh, what did I say? I think it was in Atlanta. Same thing. Hundreds wow. of, of transplanted New Yorkers go to watch the team play on television on Sunday. 
So last time I spoke to you, anecdotally, you mentioned that you've got a couple of interviews lined up. Um, now, I certainly that one of those was not this one because I think you mentioned that they were with like quite prestigious publications. So if you can't say who they're with, can you let us know when we're likely to maybe see you on our screens to talk about the book? Uh, and I, wish, I wish I could tell you when I'm, when I'm going to be on television. I'm trying to get that done myself. No, I, we've done a number of, uh, if you go online now and do a Google search for Beyond Broadway Joe, it will bring up probably a dozen newspaper articles that have been written about me and about the book. Wow. Um, and so you get a, you get a good idea. If there was a great one uh, in the New York Daily News uh, last week by um, a book reviewer who read the book, and she did, she didn't know anything about football, but she really captured what the book is about, and again, she gave it a two page spread. Um, so the, I was I was impressed with <laughs> with, yeah, well with it, and there's a lot of detail of, from the book there as well. Okay, so for our listeners, what I'll do is go and find some of those links to these um, uh, write-ups that Bob has just mentioned. So we'll get you some more places to access more information about Bob's book. Um, right. Bob, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the, the tips you've given us today and, and for the insight into what sounds like a really engaging book. And, and I do genuinely want you to send me a signed copy in the post. Uh, <laughs> well, you, you order it. Tell you, here's the deal. You order it. You have it sent to me. I'll sign it and I'll forward it to you. I will do that. I will do that. I've had, I've had a number of people do that already. Yeah. No, that sounds like a good idea. Thank you very much. Take oh, thank you. For, thank you for your time. And, and I hope everybody out there enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, Bob. Take care.